are listening to Trump Republic Radio. It is February 18th, 2018. I'm your host, Enzo Quesada. And for the first time ever, I am not joined by my co-host, Bobby Hester. Bobby is currently in Arkansas on a camping trip. So for the first time, I am doing this podcast solo, all alone. Uh, kind of nervous to be doing this show alone, but you know, Trump Republic Radio was my idea originally. Uh, it is my podcast, so you know, I guess I'm down for the new experience with it. Uh, just uh, give me a little slack, I guess today. Uh, as I said, I'm a bit nervous to do this, but uh, as you know, to what I've been up to, I am recording the podcast. Out of Plano, Texas, out of my motel room, I'm still in Texas working on the Philip Huffines for Texas Senate campaign. Uh, we only get Sundays off, so, you know, it's uh, 8.30 to 6 p.m. every single day working out there, knocking on doors, you know, at least 150 every single day. I've done up to 250 in a day before it's a uh, hard work but i mean you know one it's a job i'm working a professional campaign uh two we want to win and there's a good chance of us winning up here in district eight so uh you know just got to keep at it and we'll see how that goes early voting in our district starts this upcoming week uh, the campaign's really coming to a close, and we just re-signed our contract to the Philip Huffines campaign. So we got a lot more doors to knock on before the election is up on March 6th. But uh, enough of what I've been up to uh, up here in Plano. And on to the news this week. So the first thing that I want to go into, which has been the biggest thing that happened this week, is... This mass shooting that happened in Parkland, Florida. Uh, Parkland, Florida is about 30 miles north of Miami. Uh, it happened at M- Maorgi Stoneman Douglas High School. The suspected gunman on Wednesday, uh, Nicholas Cruz, 19 years old, shot up the school and killed 17 people. Of the people killed, uh, 12 were inside the school, 2 were outside the school, Uh, 1 died in the street, and 2 died in the hospital. You know, you gotta be living under a rock not to have seen, you know, the news on this. It's been the talk of the country, uh... Really, really sad stuff, you know. I really sympathize with the parents that have just lost their children. You know, the pain of having to bury your children is a heavy burden. You know, not to get so personal into my own life, but I had a younger brother die. He was uh, killed in a car accident a bit over a month ago. And... You know, the the pain on a parent to have to bury their children is a pain that it's something you can't describe with words. And I I really feel for all of the parents that lost their children. Uh, Talking on what happened, though, uh, Nicholas Cruz, uh, as I said, 19 years old, he brought an AR-15 to the school with multiple magazines and went about shooting. Uh, I've seen personally some Snapchat footage that the students took in the high school, and you can hear him repeatedly shooting. Uh, very, very disturbing stuff. Very disturbed individual, this uh, Nicholas Cruz. Going into him a bit. It's uh, been found out that, quote, demons in his head told, demonic voices in his head told him to commit the shooting. Uh, This is an individual that has autism. 
uh, depression and other psychotic uh, issues since 2010 the police have been called out to his family home 39 different times. Uh, Nicholas Cruz is an orphan. He was adopted by Linda and Roger Cruz. Cruz isn't his birth last name. Uh, Roger died pretty early in his life, but Linda, his adoptive mother, died back in November from pneumonia. Uh, he had been living with a family friend the last couple of months. Uh, Nicholas Cruz was expelled from the high school that he shot up uh, for fighting. Now, as I said, you know, the police had been called out to his home on 39 different occasions. Uh, these are related to a bunch of different reasons, uh, including mentally ill person, child slash elderly abuse, domestic disturbance, amongst others. Uh, also, the FBI had been called before in regards to a comment that Nicholas Cruz left on a bail, mons bail bondsman's YouTube page where he said that he was going to be a professional school shooter. Uh, this is brought to the attention of the FBI back in September, but they they did they said they didn't have enough of you know a lead to pursue him, but it was commented under his own name. He didn't use any sort of you know YouTube handle, so it really makes you wonder what's up with the FBI that they can't track this guy down. I don't know, it's insane. But as you know, as I've said, this is a guy that the authorities knew of. Uh this isn't a guy that necessarily came out of nowhere. This was someone that was on a lot of people's radar. Uh I know there was one teacher that was interviewed this week that said that he wasn't really surprised that Nicholas would be someone that would do such a horrible thing as he did uh shooting up the school. You know, ever since this uh, shooting has happened, the entire country has been in a firestorm of uh, very emotional debate over the topic of gun control. Uh, it seems like that happens every single time now one of these mass shootings happen. You know, there's been a lot of calls for gun control, banning guns, uh, you name it. But... You know, I, and I think this is a hard truth that people don't want to admit. To a degree, this isn't something that we could have entirely prevented. Now, if, if the police had, you know, done their job and stopped this guy, yeah, it would have been prevented. But there is still a factor to which I don't think that there's legislation that you can pass on the local, state, or national level in regards to guns that would have stopped this guy. With a guy this disturbed, he was going to find a way to do it. But, you know, they're now on the left framing this to if you don't want to abdicate your constitutional rights, you don't care about the lives of children. Which I just full heartedly reject. Okay. You know, if we want to do something to stop these incidences happening, personally, I believe that we need to up the security that we put in schools themselves. Okay, there wasn't anyone armed in the high school that could have dealt with this active shooter situation that they had in the high school. You know, if you had a police officer armed, or a security officer armed, or teachers armed in the classroom, maybe one of them could have stopped Nicholas before he went on to kill 17 people. I'm not saying that would have stopped everyone from, you know, being a victim, but it would have reduced it, and that's what I truly believe is the best we can do. 
you know, as I said, there's a, to a degree with all these mass shootings that we just can't prevent these sort of things from happening. And one of the scariest things in life for people is to admit that there are things out of side of control because we want to feel like we're in control of life. But these things, to a degree, they just happen. But I will admit, I mean, these mass shootings have gone up tenfold over the past decade. You know, school shootings have existed in this country. You know, it's not a new phenomenon, but they've really taken off. And really, they've taken off since the implementation of the Internet, I would say. Uh, you know, the first really big headline one that sticks out of in recent history is Columbine, and that's when the Internet was first starting to take off. And, you know, we really see the Columbine effect happening afterwards, where we get all these copycat killers who see, you know, the media that these shootings get. And, it, uh, you know, it plays a motivating factor for these shooters that want to go out and make a name for themselves. You know, to another degree, as I mentioned with the, the internet, the social lives of high school kids is way different than what it used to be for past generations. You know, I've spent some time in the high school classroom myself in a teaching role before, and uh, social media changes the dynamics heavily. You know, it was there to a degree for me when I was in high school, but it's even worse now. You know, you look at, say, bullying in the past. It used to be you know, the bullying happens on school grounds, and it just happens there. But now with, you know, social media, the bullying can continue afterwards. You know, I'm just saying, these are different aspects of uh, social life for high schoolers that we just don't know. We, we don't have a guide for with uh, past histories. But, um, you know, they, they've mentioned more so on some of the things that motivated this shooting, and they said that there is potentially a feud in regards to an ex-girlfriend, and, you know, he had fought with the guy that his ex-girlfriend was now seeing, and maybe that was a motivating factor in this, I don't know. He seemed like a very disturbed individual. But, uh... Not good stuff. Not good stuff with this Nicholas Cruz. But, it, you know, talking, and obviously, I'm just talking off the top of my head. You know, with, with the conversations we've been seeing in regards to gun control, you know, specifically focused on the AR-15, because it seems to be the weapon that uh, these shooters use the most. And I'm familiar personally with shooting AR-15s. I've shot multiple. I don't own one. Uh, it's not the most powerful weapon that someone can legally acquire. It, you know, it's a semi-automatic weapon that fires, you know, as, as, mu as fast as you can pull the trigger. So it, it, as opposed to other weapons you can acquire... You know, it has a marginally different rate of fire, a negligible rate rate of fire difference from other weapons you can acquire, I should say. Uh, you know, it's crazy how uninformed people are on firearms in general. I've been seeing a lot of people saying that the AR-15 is a weapon that is a weapon of war that shouldn't be owned by anyone in the public. Okay, first off, the AR-15... Is not a weapon that has been used in any war. Okay, it's modeled off of the M4, which is, you know, used by the military. But, you know, the caliber on the AR-15 is substantially smaller than what you can legally acquire elsewhere. In terms of power, it's... Not the most powerful gun you could use. I mean, as someone that shot the AR-15, I will say, it's a good weapon. It is a very good weapon. And, you know, when you're firing it, you could see why someone would choose to want to use the gun. The recoil on them, you know, is very low. Uh, you can get shots off pretty quickly and accurately. 
but I I just don't see why we should have to surrender our constitutional rights every single time one of these things happen if you can't really demonstrably show that these instances will just go away by doing so, okay? A lot of times they point to, oh, in Australia they had a mass shooting and they implemented such and such uh, gun control laws and they haven't seen as many mass shootings. But Australia, you know, didn't have many guns to begin with. You know, when they implemented the law that the liberals are always referencing, there was only around 500,000 weapons in the country. Okay, in the United States, we have, I believe, over 800 million firearms in the country. It, it's not something that you can just, you know, with a magic wand control. And you look at the cities where we have stronger, you know, gun control laws, such as Chicago, the, the homicide rates are some of the worst. You know, there there is a case to be made where... There is high gun ownership. The homicide rates are lower. You know, we can compare two different countries that have similar populations. Honduras and Switzerland. Both have around 8.2 million citizens. Honduras, citizens cannot privately own firearms and is the highest homicide rate in the entire world. Where you look in Switzerland, they have some of the highest uh, gun ownership amongst the public, and they have some of the lowest homicide rates in the entire world. So, you know, the existence of guns is not the issue at hand here. Okay, you know, uh, the leftists, they always like to say, oh, the NRA has blood on their hands from all these mass shootings. They won't do anything about this. The NRA is the only organization that can get blamed for incidents where members of the organization don't commit any crime. It's insane. But, uh, yeah, I, I think there are two areas that you can point to that really are the cause of these mass shootings. One is the media effect, and two is the new state of alienation in high schools, and that's articulated a lot through internet usage. Uh, the dynamics are just crazy now, and uh, I don't know. I don't think I have too much else on this case, though. Uh, it was shortly believed for a time he was some sort of white supremacist or had ties to a militia or ties to Antifa or was a communist, but... All those things have been, you know, outed as fake news at this point, and I never really believed them to begin with, because, you know, when we see these mass shooting incidences from all sides of the political spectrum, people want to frame it in a way that fits their narrative on things. We saw this, you know, with the Las Vegas shooting as well. They tried to say that the shooter in Las Vegas was an Antifa member or a Trump supporter or this and that, and... You gotta have some hesitancy before putting such a label on these things, because, like I said, these are politically motivated things that people put out there. You know, fake news. But uh, the police confirmed that he wasn't any sort of white supremacist or militia member or Antifa of the sort. So, uh, moving on now, let's go into something big that happened on Friday, and that is... Uh, Robert Mueller has, you know, given a list of indictments towards 13 different Russian nationals in regards to his ongoing, you know, Russia probe. So he gave a 37-page indictment that can contained a number of key revelations about the investigation, and for the first time, U.S. government law enforcement authorities have in detail demonstrated the operations of a sophisticated Russian-run conspiracy complete with stunts, rallies, paid political advertisements, a fake social media presence, and falsified identities with which Russians pretended to be Americans and even communicated with unwitting members of the President Donald Trump's 2016 campaign. 
so right there, there's a, there's a big thing that strikes, you know, into the core of this whole investigation. The idea of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russian nationals. But he said in his report here that all the individuals that were communicated with from the Trump campaign unwittingly communicated. So they had no knowledge. So right there, he's saying pretty much there's no collusion whatsoever. Uh, also going into some of the other things, uh, it looks like some of the individuals tried to sow the seeds of chaos in American politics on the behalf of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and against Hillary Clinton and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. Uh, I guess I, I can get into, because, you know, what we've seen from these revelations in this 37 page uh indictment are pretty strange things actually uh let me go into some of these strange examples bizarre birthday wishes on may 29 2016 the defendants arranged for an american to stand in front of the white house and hold a sign reading quote happy 55th birthday dear boss the indictment claims that this is related to the June 1st birthday of Russian oligarch Eugenie Prignahiv, which I've probably said completely wrong, who allegedly paid for the campaign. What does that have to do with, like, Russian subversion of the election whatsoever? I don't know. Uh, derogatory comments. According to the indictment, participants in the campaign posted derogatory information about a number of candidates, including Clinton and Senators Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. The indictment does not outline the actual content of the comments posted. So, saying derogatory things about candidates in an American election and being Russian is somehow subversion of American democracy. Like, it's not illegal to say these things on the internet and be Russian. Uh, used hashtags. Demonstrating evil genius, the defendants used a number of hashtags in their social media posts, such as hashtag Trump 2016 and hashtag Hillary for prison. So again, is it some sort of mass subversion of American democracy for... Russian nationals to use hashtags on Twitter? That's not illegal whatsoever. Uh, are there any other things? Oh, yeah. Choose peace, vote Jill Stein. Uh, the evil Russian masterminds allegedly encouraged minorities not to vote using fake accounts such as woke blacks and blacktivists to say, quote, choose peace and vote for Jill Stein. On a Muslim account, they posted, quote, American Muslims are boycotting elections today. Most of the American Muslim voters refuse to vote for Hillary Clinton because she wants to continue the war on Muslims in the Middle East and voted yes for invading Iraq. The accounts may be fake, but what exactly isn't true about this? You know, uh, a lot of people on the left cited third party votes as why Clinton lost but um if someone chooses to vote Jill Stein because an account on Twitter said that a vote for Jill Stein is a vote for peace where exactly is the lie as I just said I mean Hillary advocated for creating a no fly zone in Syria this would have brought in the war in Syria pretty much like I mean, you know, this has been said by individuals in the U.S. military. If we were to set up such a fly zone as Hillary wanted to do, we would have to go to war with Russia. So, you know, I don't know why we'd want that.
Uh, sad political rallies. The defendants organized a number of political rallies, posting about them on social media accounts and asking other groups to promote them. For the Support Hillary Save American Muslims rally on July 9, 2016 in Washington, D.C., they allegedly got an American to hold a sign saying, quote, I think Sharia law will be a powerful new direction of freedom. It was supposed to be attributed to Clinton. This was actually reported by the Daily Beast in September. Uh, two, quote, March for Trump down with Hillary rallies were also organized in July 2016. This is also reported by the Daily Beast. So, uh, apparently they organized rallies both for and against Donald Trump. I don't know exactly how this is supposed to be illegal and how this aids into the idea that Trump colluded with Russians if the Russians weren't even fully behind him. But, uh, yeah, you know, I've seen a lot of liberals go crazy over these, you know, indictments that Mueller has handed out. But really, they show that the probe has nothing whatsoever. And, you know, if the liberals actually knew what was in this, uh, you know, 37-page indictment, there's nothing really to be excited about. And, you know, really it just comes down to these were... Predominantly like troll farms and Russian social media accounts that said things that were pertained to the election. And we're supposed to believe that this swayed the American election. Okay, I didn't vote because I saw... I didn't vote for Donald Trump because I saw some post by a Russian on Twitter, okay? I don't think anyone did really. And you know... Looking back on some things that we've talked about in the past on the show, uh, if you remember, the media came out and said, "Oh, a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred, yeah, hundred thousand dollars in ads were taken by Russian nationals in regards to the 2016 election." You know, I've used Facebook ads before, and a uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of Facebook ads isn't going to do you a whole lot. Okay, potentially, you know, it, that that kind of money, the ads would have been exposed to millions of people, but when you do these sort of ads, the return on for the money that you put in isn't the biggest in the world. Okay, $100,000 isn't going to sway the American election. And, you know, also, when we talk about, uh, you know, the ads that I'm just talking about now, the majority of those were actually taken after the election. Uh, the media always likes to leave that detail out. So really the whole Trump-Russia connection, collusion thing, it's all just fraud. And the Mueller you know, probe, it's a waste of time at this point. It's a waste of money, and it's a complete joke. So uh, yeah, I think I've said my piece on that. Let's go on now to a thing Trump announced on Monday, which is a plan to fund a $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill. As I said, uh, he released this on Monday as a part of his grander budget that he wants. And uh, I gotta say, I'm not too entirely impressed with the infrastructure bill. Uh... It only wants to put around $200 billion of federal funding towards the infrastructure bill. The rest is supposed to be done by state, local, and private funding means. Uh, and most of that $200 billion would be put towards local, uh, to match local spending to give them incentives to expand, uh, or to give them incentives to invest into the infrastructure proposal and also to expand loan programs. Now, you know, during the general election, Trump ran on doing a $1 trillion infrastructure bill. Uh, as I said, this is a $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill. But, um... Yeah, you know, I, I don't disagree with doing this, but I just don't think that this plan is very good. Now, across the board, you know, an infrastructure bill has a lot of bipartisan support. 
maybe lawmakers will be able to come up with something from the plan that Trump gave them. Because, you know, if you understand politics, Trump can't just put the legislation on the floor. You know, someone in Congress has to do that. But, um, yeah, I'm not entirely impressed. Uh, nothing much more beyond that to say. Uh, let's go into some stuff as far as how the feds have collected a record number of taxes, uh, this first month of 2018, and we actually have a surplus at the moment from collected tax revenues. Uh, during January, the Treasury collected approximately $361 billion in total tax revenue and spent a total of approximately $300 billion which is something that we haven't done in a very long time. Now, despite the monthly surplus, the federal government is still running a deficit of approximately $175 billion for fiscal year 2018. That is because the government entered the month with a deficit of approximately $224 billion. $224 billion. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, you know, record number of tax dollars coming in, and, you know, January's tax collecting is impacted by the new tax bill that we signed in December. So it's interesting to see that the numbers of tax revenue is still up despite the cuts. But as we said, you know, taking in mind the deficit, the surplus doesn't really mean too much. So take it for what it is. Uh, going on now to something that I've actually looked forward to all week to talk about, which I'm disappointed that I don't get to talk to Bobby about this because uh, I, I believe he had some good uh, opinions on this as well. But um, Trump is wanting to replace food stamps with a blue apron type program. Uh, President Donald Trump, and this was a part of uh, his budget that he proposed, uh, President Donald Trump wants to drastically scale back food stamps and replace them with a food box delivery program like Blue Apron. Uh, Mick Mulvaney, director of the Office of Management and Budget, told reporters on Monday about the plan by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to redesign the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, as American's Harvest Box. Under the plan, more than 16 million households would have half of their benefits go towards the food box delivery program. Uh, quote, what we do is propose that for folks who are on food stamps, part, not all, part of their benefits come from in the actual sort of, and I don't want to steal somebody's copyright, but a blue apron type program where you actually receive the food instead of receive the cash, uh, Mulvaney said. Blue Apron is a company that sells weekly meal service kits that come with ingredients and re recipes that are cooked at home by the customer. Three meals a week for a family of four comes at about $140 in the New York area. Among the offerings are beef medallions and scallions, salsa verde, uh, salmon and Dukad spiced vegetables, according to Blue Apron's website. Under the government's current program, food stamp recipients use a payment card similar to a debit card to buy food, and the USDA has strict rules about what can be bought with the benefits. Alcohol, household items, and pet food, among other items, cannot be purchased. The Trump administration's proposal could shake up the country's largest program designed to battle domestic hunger issues. The proposed budget released Monday would gut SNAP benefits by $17.2 billion in 2019, about 22% of the program's total cost last year. USDA claims that the new plan would save $129.2 billion over the next 10 years. So yeah, you know, when I saw this, I was uh, pretty excited, really thinking outside of the box on how we're, you know, distributing welfare benefits. You know, this is one thing that the Republicans said that they wanted to do 
after tax reform is work on entitlements and entitlement reform. And I, I think this is some a uh, move in the right direction. So, and we've reported on this in the past. There's been many instances where you know SNAP or EBT cards or food stamps of the sort. There's fraud in the system, and people sell away these benefits or you know they hoard up these benefits but you can't really do that if we're not giving you the money and we're just giving you the boxes of food uh i'd like to see these people try and you know receive the boxes and just sell those away i don't think it'll work out very well for them you, it, you know if we implement a program such as this we'd see a lot of people jump off the program um, which i mean you know if receiving box fulls of food is not adequate enough to you for food assistance what are you really doing i don't know and you know there's been many instances where you watch uh people brag on social media how they're buying you know filet mignon with their ebt cards i don't really want people doing that okay if you want something other than the options that they're giving you with these uh, Blue Apron box uh, meals, go buy it yourself with your own money, okay? I've been seeing leftists on the internet say, oh, we're dehumanizing the poor by doing such a program. I, I really think it's laughable to think that it's dehumanizing to give people food that need food assistance. So yeah, you know, funny stuff. Hopefully this stuff happens. Uh, I think it'd be good for the country. And, you know, apparently it will save a lot of money. I mean, the government, I'd like to see them implement the system. Because, first, because, you know, the government doesn't really do much things efficiently. I kind of doubt the savings that they're saying would be as much as they're saying. But, I mean, there must be some sort of savings. Otherwise, they wouldn't propose such a, you know, reform. With that said, uh, let's go into the immigration news for the week. Open the door, immigration. La migra, la migra, vamos, niños. This week in immigration. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the immigration bills that were taken to the senate floor this week uh senators on thursday blocked all four plans dealing with immigration as president trump torpedoed one proposal as a total total catastrophe and his department of homeland security lambasted as the end of immigration enforcement in america during a series of afternoon procedural votes no immigration amendments crossed the 60 vote threshold that would have cut off debate and passed the way for final votes. The efforts to pass immigration legislation come as Democrats insist on protecting young illegal aliens brought to the country as children and Trump demands funding for a border wall. Ahead of the votes, the Trump administration focused on the bipartisan agreement drawn up by the, quote, Gang of 22, which the, would grant a 10-12 to year path to the... Uh, 10 to 12 year path to citizenship for the young illegal aliens on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, otherwise known as DACA. The amendment failed by only getting 54 votes. 45 senators voted against it. So yeah, you know, for many months now we've been tracking all these different DACA bills that they're trying to give out and you know, I've had people come to me that are listeners of the program saying, Oh, Enzo, I'm getting really uh, afraid with all the talk that's happening right now. It seems like Trump is willing to, you know, just give up the ball on the stack of stuff and give the amnesty. No, no, doesn't look like that's happening. You know, as I said, you know, four different plans were put into the Senate on the vote this week, and not a single one of them could make the 60-vote threshold in the Senate. There's no bill, conceivably at the moment, that satisfies the president, satisfies the Democrats, satisfies the, you know, uh, pro-amnesty wing of the Republican Party, and satisfies the more hardline immigration 
uh, senators for the Republicans. And this is a situation that, you know, we expected to be seen. And, I mean, the the March 5th deadline for DACA is quickly coming. And uh, there's no fix in sight. So I'm pretty excited on that. You know, uh, this bill that reached the 54-vote threshold, which uh, you know saw the likes of Jeff Flake and Lisa Murkowski and Cory Gardner and all these other crappy GOP senators... It, one, didn't stop chain migration whatsoever, which is one thing that Trump required in a bill. Two, didn't end the visa lottery program whatsoever, which Trump also required for any bill that he would sign. And three, only funded the border wall for two million, two billion dollars, which, uh, you know, the border wall is estimated to cost between 15 to 25 billion dollars. If you're not funding the full wall, we're just not going to sign anything. So uh, we're in a really good situation here at the moment. Uh, you know, these Democrats aren't willing to compromise to the degree that Trump wants whatsoever because you know, giving up a wall is betraying their base to their Democratic base. You know, you're not allowed to do that. And in the long term, what Trump would want on chain migration and visa lottery would bring in less immigrants over the next coming decades, which, you know, the Democrats want coming here so they can have a voter base for the future. And the DAC kids that they'd receive in, you know, exchange for that would not be enough voters to, you know, give up uh, these demands on immigration. So, you know, the Democrats are willing to throw these DACA kids to the lion to maintain immigration how it currently stands. So, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, coming up with these primaries, Democrats are going to be mad at the incumbents for not saving the DACA kids. They're going to force their candidates to go even more leftward. And as I've said so many times on the program, there is a record number of competitors in Democratic primaries at the moment. You know, normally you'll see around 50 to 60 different competitors as far as uh, House primaries go. There's over 200 currently announced running for Democrat House primaries. So they're only going to push each other more left. And, you know, you look at the Harvard-Harris poll that uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago, which shows that, you know, Around 80% of Americans want to see a reduction in legal immigration. And for the most part, there's overwhelming support for the kind of policies that Trump wants. So, they're in a terrible situation. How are you supposed to transition from the fighting each other leftward through the primaries to winning a midterm, you know, election? where you have immigration policies that don't appeal to the right or the middle whatsoever, not to independence whatsoever, and you know, looking at some of the findings that we have from the Harvard-Harris poll, a lot of Democrats don't even want the stuff that they'd have to advocate for to win a Democratic primary. So we're in a great situation at the moment. Uh, Trump's planning on ending DACA is mastermind because it forces the issue into these primaries and into the midterms, which is what we want. I mean, immigration is most of the fighting on politics at the moment. It's where we want to keep things. Good, good stuff. Uh, let's go into some bad stuff, though. And uh, that is a second judge has ruled against Trump's administration on ending DACA. For the second time in as many months, a federal judge has barred the Trump administration from ending the Obama-era DACA program next month. U.S. District Judge Nicholas Garofuris in New York ruled Tuesday that Attorney General Jeff Sessions had erred in concluding that DACA is unconstitutional and granted a preliminary injunction sought by state attorneys general and immigrants who had sued the administration. The Justice Department had no immediate comment on Garofoulos' ruling. Uh, last month, U.S. Judge 
William Alsup in San Francisco ruled that DACA must remain in place while litigation uh, surrounding the program is ongoing. The U.S. Supreme Court is currently considering whether to take up the Trump administration's appeal on that ruling. So, not good stuff. We have more of these uh, you know, district judges making rulings on DACA, which, you know, from the get-go, DACA was an unconstitutional executive order by President Obama. It is not within his ability to give any sort of protections for aliens in the nation. But now we have, you know, these courts trying to uphold an unconstitutional executive order. And it's within the president's capacity from the executive office to repeal prior executive orders from past administrations. So this is, uh, you know, as I, I mentioned, something that they're going to be taking to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Trump administration, you know, in past weeks have asked for the Supreme Court to expedite their ruling on this, you know, get it done as quickly as possible. And uh, this is a ruling that we should see go our way, I'm very confident on, even more so than, you know, the whole quote-unquote Muslim ban, travel ban. This is uh, well within the president's power to do, and, uh, you know, once we get that done with the Supreme Court, we can uh, end this program. But currently, the program is upheld. they got to keep it going, even though it's supposed to expire on March 5th. Uh, to go into the next story now, which is a, a story out of North Carolina about a illegal alien who killed a toddler because he was impaired from drunk driving. So uh, this week, or actually last Sunday, early last Sunday, uh, Jose Romero, 27 years old, an illegal alien from El Salvador, slammed into an ambulance that overturned after being struck, killing a three-year-old boy, as I said, out of uh, Winston-Salem. The boy from Wise, Virginia, died Monday, a day after the crash. He was with his mother in the ambulance when it was struck and rolled over. Uh, the boy has not been identified. Jose Duran Romero, 27 years old, blew a point. One nine on the breathalyzer nearly two hours after the crash, more than twice the legal limit. So, you know, his blood alcohol level was even higher when he slammed into the ambulance. Uh, court papers say Romero, who was behind the wheel of a Honda Accord, even though he had never owned a driver's license, had bloodshot, glassy eyes, slurred his speech, and looked grossly impaired, according to... Uh, Fox 9, Winston, Salem. So, uh, yeah, another American citizen killed because an illegal alien's here. Just, uh, another American citizen that just doesn't matter to people that want to keep illegal aliens here. And, you know, I've I mentioned this so many times in the program, but, you know, when the Trump administration used to give the decline detainer reports early on in the Trump administration, which uh, shows you which jurisdictions are not uh, accepting decline detainers, which means honoring requests by ICE to hold an illegal alien until they can get them in their custody. Instead, they just let them go. You you look for, like, Travis County, which is, uh, you know, where Austin, Texas is. You know, Got to talk about the local stuff for me as a Texan. Every single week with the declined detainers, you'd see around 20 to 25 different illegal aliens that they would have declined detainers for for drunk driving. You know, drunk driving just seems to be this one thing for these illegal aliens that they can't do. And and there's every single weekend, there's thousands of illegal aliens drunk driving in the country. They're all just ticking time bombs to kill another American 
citizen. And you know, these liberals, they all like to say, you know, going back to the gun control thing, oh, if we can pass a law that can save one life, it would be worth it. Why can't we, you know, enforce the laws on immigration to save one life? If it's, or is the life of this toddler not worth it? I don't know. So yeah, pretty, pretty upsetting stuff out there in North Carolina. Let's move on now to uh, some stuff out of Florida, which is a uh, rather, rather humorous to my perspective. So, uh, more than a dozen advocacy advocacy groups issued a warning about traveling in Florida on Wednesday, saying immigration arrests there have soared more rapidly in the past year than in any part of the country. Leaders for immigrant rights and nonprofit organizations said new cooperation between immigration and customs enforcement and 17 Florida sheriffs is also spreading fear in the state. The travel advisor issued by 15 groups warned immigrants from other states to reconsider Florida trips or to be ready to encounter immigration agents at airports, seaports, and bus stations. Now, uh, back in May, the American Civil Liberties, uh, Liberties Unions, the ACLU, uh, issued a similar warning to uh, illegal aliens going to Texas. So, uh, I guess Florida is now one of these places that uh, illegal aliens need to be a little concerned about. And, um, you know, kind of glad that they're concerned to go to Florida. You know, good for the citizens there. They don't have to deal with these people. Going on now to the last story that we have for immigration, uh, we're going on to a story that is also out of you know my home state of Texas, which is very infuriating and uh, is also related to Travis County, uh, yeah, the county where I as as for mentioned Austin, Texas is. A Texas sheriff refused to sign a letter agreeing to hold. Arrested illegal a aliens for ICE. Uh, Austin, Texas. Travis County Sheriff's Office deputies lost the opportunity to receive life-saving ballistic vests after the department sheriff decided it was more important to shield illegal aliens from federal agents. The vests were made available through a unanimously approved state Senate bill in 2017, which allocated... $25 million to help Texas law enforcement agencies to purchase the gear for their officers in the wake of the July 7, 2016 police ambush in Dallas, which left five officers dead. In January, Governor Abbott declared that $23 million in grants for, from the funds would be dispersed to buy 33,000 vests for over 450 law enforcement departments who had applied. Every agency that applied was accepted. The vests are designed to protect against more powerful rounds than the low-caliber bullet vest commonly issued to Texas law enforcement officers. The applications, which were due by September 6, 2017, required agency leaders to sign a letter confirming compliance with Immigration and Custom Enforcement detainer requests both now and during the grant term of at least one year, uh, Travis County Commissioner's Court records said. Project manager Valerie Holier planned to apply for the grant in the amount of $240,000 to purchase over 200 rifle-resistant vests for Travis County. Quote, it is anticipated the number of fatal shootings will be reduced by equipping more officers with Type 3 and 4 body armor, Holier wrote in her recommendation for seeking the grant. The only other requirement needed to complete the application was a written commitment from the Travis County Sheriff Sally Hernandez, uh, agreeing to hold arrested illegal aliens for ICE, but the sheriff refused. According to county documents, Sheriff Hernandez said she wanted to see whether or not a law banning sanctuary cities would be upheld by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals before she would decide to see if she was required to cooperate with ICE. Regardless of the appeals court ruling, the case is widely anticipated to proceed to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
So there you go, you know, Sheriff Sally Hernandez, which someone I'm familiar with as someone that lives not far from Austin, Texas, the capital of Texas, cares more about protecting illegal aliens from being deported than the safety of her own officers that are under her. Really very, very sickening stuff. And, uh... Par for the course for elected officials in Austin, Texas. You know, people, they assume with Texas, it's an extremely red uh, part of the country, which, I mean, is true. But uh, Austin is extremely blue. Uh, Our big cities here in Texas are extremely blue. Uh, Where I am, Plano, uh, which is in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it's actually very red, though, so... That's why I'm stationed here for my primary uh, race. Anyways, talking about races, let's go on to the one thing that I have of note here in regards to the 2018 midterm elections, and that is Republicans lead in generic ballot polls for the very first time. Republicans have erased the Democratic advantage on the generic congressional ballot in a new Politico, Politico morning consulate poll that... Uh, poll. I'm sorry. Fully 39% of registered voters say that they would support the GOP candidate for Congress in their district, while 38% would back the Democrat candidate. Nearly a quarter of voters, 23%, are undecided. Uh, Voters are split almost evenly among party lines. Democratic voters break for their party... 85% to 5%, while Republicans similarly favored the GOP, 34% to 8%. Among independent voters, 26% say that it would vote for the Democrat, 25% say they vote for the Republican, and nearly half, 49%, are undecided. The GOP's one-point advantage comes after three months of tracking in which Democrats maintain a lead ranging between two and ten points on the generic ballot. So, uh, you know, I've been watching these generic ballots for quite a while. And, you know, for a good amount of the past couple of months, the Democrats have had ten-point leads over the generic ballot Republican, which means... You know, in a poll, who's ever running for Congress in your district? Are you going to vote for the Republican or the Democrat? But this lead is gone. I mean, the GOP has a one-point lead at the moment. Which, you know, off the tails of the elections in Alabama and Virginia, the Democrats had in their mind, like, oh, there's this huge blue wave coming. But you look at the polling now, and that wave is all but gone. But, uh, you know, let them continue to have that overconfidence in the coming blue wave. Because uh, when they have the shock of reality that the votes that they believe are going to be there for Democrats isn't there, they're, they're, they'll be in for a rude awakening. And a lot of this has to do with... Uh, the success of the tax reform bill, you know, we went over last week on the show support for the tax reform bill initially before being signed into legislation. Very, very unpopular. But, uh, you know, support for the bill has gone up tremendously. And, you know, we we talked about last week some polling numbers on how uh, people trust in the GOP more on a lot of policy issues. You know, just go back to December. In mid-December, 39% of voters said they trusted the Democrats more to handle the economy compared to 38%. Today, that is 43% say they trust Republicans to run the economy as opposed to 32% of Democrats. So, you know, in things that matter policy-wise, Democrats are losing big league. Uh, let's go on now to one more story that I want to get into before we go into some current year college craziness. And that is in regards to, uh, an article that was published in the New York Times. 
In an article published in the New York Times on Saturday, former CIA officers and several researchers who have been studying covert U.S. intelligence operations for years say that while methods allegedly used by Russians to meddle into the U.S. elections might slightly differ from the old-school CIA operative operations overseas, there's nothing in the allegations against Russia that Americans haven't done themselves. Quote, if you ask an intelligence officer, did the Russians break the rules or do something bizarre, the answer is no, not at all. Retired CIA veteran Stephen Hall told the New York Times' Scott Shane. Hall, who had left his job as CIA chief of Russian operations in 2015 after 30 years of service, noted that the U.S. has never shunned attempting to meddle in other countries' elections. Saying that the CIA had absolutely engaged in such operations in the past, Hall added that he hopes we keep doing it. Uh, Locke Johnson, a scholar at the University of Georgia who has been investigating in CIA since the, 20, er, since the 1970s, told the Times the following, quote, We've used posters, pamphlets, mailers, banners, you name it. We've planted false information in foreign newspapers. We've used what the British call King George's Cavalry suitcases of cash. Johnson said, recounting that in the late 1980s, we told, he was told by CIA operatives that they used to plant reports that fit the U.S. agenda, or bluntly, fake news, in foreign newspapers by the dozen. The number of such daily insertions ran in as many as 70 to 80 publications, he recounted. But when the U.S. does it, it's for the greater good, the scholar and the CIA officer claimed. Likening the American operations to what Russia is accused of is, quote, is like saying cops and bad guys are the same because they both have guns. The motivation matters, Hall said. Because, just because, you know, we do it, that means it's good. And whatever the Russians do... That's terrible, because America is just this beacon of uh, freedom. It really is crazy to see, you know, former CIA operatives talk about this. You know, I, I read the whole article. I was just reading y'all a bit about it. Because, you know, from what platform can we condemn Russia for the minor, minor things that they have done? Which... You know, likely didn't sway the 2016 election whatsoever. When us as the United States, we've been doing this for decades in countries all across the world. And, you know, it, it opens up into greater light this whole idea of foreign influence in elections to a conversation that I think needs to be had because if we're saying now with what has come out with the Mueller uh, indictments that saying things on Twitter with hashtags is foreign subversion when foreign nationals do it, I think it's time that we look at some things in the United States that are you know foreign influences that are actually having a much greater influence on American elections. So the first thing I want to talk about is APAC, which is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, APAC is one of the biggest donators to both the Republicans and the Democrats as part of campaign donations. This is a foreign institution advocating for, you know, American policy in regards to Israel that donates billions upon billions of dollars to American you know, elected officials and people running for office. And they don't have to... They don't have to register as a foreign entity like they want to do with Russians these days. I think... 
APEC has a much stronger influence on American elections than any, you know, Russian posting a hashtag has ever done. Now, we also in the past have talked about, uh, you know, there, there was a report, and I'm looking it up at the moment, of, you know, instances of illegal aliens or non-citizens voting in U.S. elections. You know, uh, the report... Here, give me a second. I gotta look this up. I apologize. Yeah. So... In the 2008 election, there was a study by a research group out of New Jersey, and they found that 5.7 million non-citizens voted in the 2008 election. Man, I, I'm a bit sorry. I'm a little unprepared on this. I am a one-man show at the moment. <laughs> but we, we've, we've talked about this before on the show many times. Uh, let me find the exact study for you. But, you know, potentially 5.7 million non-citizens voting in the 2008 election. You can only imagine that number has gone up since then. You know, Hillary won the popular vote by 3 million votes. Oh, yes, yeah, the study is from Just Facts, a New Jersey-based research group. The study, based on data compiled from Harvard University Cooperative Congressional Election Study, an analysis published in the journal Electoral Studies, co-authored by Old Dominion University faculty and census data, also provides some support for what then-president-elect Donald Trump tweeted in late November when he asserted that he won the popular vote if the fraudulent votes were deducted. So yeah, as I just said, you know, Clinton won the popular vote by around 3 million. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2008, they found 5.7 million non-citizens voted, and... Say just a, you know, the same number of non-citizens voted in the 2016 presidential election. Non-citizens would obviously favor the person who's not trying to deport non-citizens that aren't supposed to be here. So you can assume that the lean on that vote goes to Clinton. And, you know, if more of those votes were in specific states that were very close, like Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania... Hillary Clinton could be the president. And, you know, the majority of these non-citizens who voted were from Mexico. So the influence of Mexico and Israel have a much greater impact on our democracy than Russia does. But why should we even play this game if, you know, we don't even have a moral high ground to stand on? I don't know. But uh, with that said, let's go into some current year college craziness. The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. You're fucking a white male! The assumption that women are naturally better caregivers is part of hate it's time for some current year college craziness. Current year college craziness, the segment of the show where we talk about the crazy stuff that happens on college campuses here and abroad, but predominantly here because, you know, we get the best crazy colleges in the world. And, uh, 
We'll start it off at a college in Massachusetts, Smith College. Uh, this first story, not exactly craziness, but it is still very humorous to me, which is why I put it on the list this week. Uh, Smith College is hosting a panel advocating to get more women into the construction industry after government estimates report approximately 3% of construction workers in the U.S. are female. <coughs> Organized by college professor Carrie Baker, the all-female Massachusetts college will host the panel discussion titled Only 3% Are Women? And that's followed by an exclamation mark and a question mark. A form on diversifying the construction worker, the construction workforce to try and get more women to join what has traditionally been a male-dominated profession. Baker teaches courses on gender, law, public policy, and feminist activism, including topical courses on sex trafficking, reproductive justice, and sexual harassment. So yeah, you know, this isn't something I'm exactly opposed to, you know. Hey, you want to diversify construction with more women? I mean, if they're good enough, fine. But it's uh, it's funny that they really have to... It takes a leader in the whole feminist sphere to rally behind this report to even bring this up to women. Because women across the board don't want to do construction jobs. You know, they're they're always saying, oh, we need to get equal representation in this industry of workforce and this industry of work. But uh, you don't see feminists ever really advocating for construction jobs. But you finally do have one there in Smith College in Massachusetts. Uh, the next story that I want to get into is out of Canada, uh, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. Dalhousie University is restricting its search for a new senior position to racially visible and indigenous candidates in an effort to make the institution more diverse. In an email to the university community, Provost and Vice President Academic Carolyn Waters wrote that, quote, community consultation is essential to the success of the search for a new Vice Provost Students Affairs, quote, in keeping with the principles of our employment equity policy and with an aim to increase the representation of underrepresented groups in Dollhouse, this search for a new vice provost student affairs will be restricted to racially visible persons and aboriginal peoples at the time. She wrote, Jasmine Walsh, Assistant Vice President for Human Resources, said while Dalhousie has done a good job for hiring diverse faculty, it has a way to go when it comes to management positions. Quote, Dalhousie strives to be an inclusive space for all members of our community, and we acknowledge that this requires us to be in a constant state of learning and working within our communities to make sure that we've lived up to the commitment that we make, she told the uh, CBC's Maritime Noon. According to Dalhousie's 2016 Be Counted Census campaign, the percentage of racially visible employees increased to 11% in 2016 from 8.3% in 2015, the largest gain in, with the largest gains in faculty positions. So it's interesting, you know. It's uh, pretty much saying uh, whites need not apply. <laughs> It, uh, and, you know, in the quote from the uh, Walsh lady, Dalhousie strives to be an inclusive space for all members of our community. All except white people. It, you know, the whole diversity stuff, it's so Orwellian. It, it, it really only means less white people. But, you know, for these people, that's a, that's a moral thing. You know, even though... You know, people that aren't white make up a tiny percentage of the college in the area at large. It is so important for these people, apparently, to fill, you know, the positions of the college with non-white people. It's not about merit at all to these people. It's all just about 
what you look like. Which is really a message that we should be sending with our colleges. It really shows how intellectual we are. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm joking there. Let's go on now to a story out of uh, Brown University, which is in uh, Rhode Island. 18 Brown University students recently signed an open letter vehemently objecting to an appearance by conservative commentator Guy Benson Tuesday night. The letter declares that Benson's support for free speech is explicitly dangerous to marginalized people, arguing that free speech only benefits those who hold privileged identities. Students at the Brown University vehemently objected to a speech by conservative pundit Guy Benson, who... I personally don't know who that is, saying he enables white supremacist and fascist ideas by supporting free speech. The 18 students calling themselves, quote, a collective of students at Brown University wrote an open letter slamming Benson's appearance at Brown Tuesday night, even preemptively arguing that the event violates the student code of conduct. The letter first attacks Benson's support for freedom of speech, specifically referencing his view that hate speech should not be limited by the government. Which, you know, if you know how uh, the Supreme Court has ruled on hate speech, hate speech is free speech. Unanimously, they uphold that. Quote, Based on our research into the speaker, we anticipate that Benson will make arguments in support of the freedom of any person to make hateful, oppressive, or damaging remarks based on their constitutionally protected rights of rights to freedom of speech. They then contend that the event is an insult to the history of student activism at Brown, declaring that they, quote, will not stand idly by as our proud history of student activism is belittled and the real emotional, physical, and psychological needs of marginalized students are denigrated as Illogical and irrelevant. So apparently, and when they say marginalized students, that obviously is non-white and non-heterosexual and non-male. Apparently, you know, that's that's more important than constitutional rights, you know. Marginalized people are more important. Uh, the letter goes on to say that the... Con- the conversation surrounding free speech is, quote, explicitly dangerous to the well-being and the continued thriving of people of color and other marginalized people. So freedom of speech, to have a conversation around it, is explicitly dangerous. They don't say so much, when, which, you know, in a, in a court of law, you'd actually have to, like, say, you know, how... It is dangerous, but, uh, you know, they just assert it blanketly and make you, ass- you know, fill in the blanks yourself. Uh, going on now, uh, quote, So often, popular conversations around free speech focuses on the right of people with power or who hold privileged identities, i.e., who are white or cisgender men or wealthy or able-bodied, etc., to espouse hateful rhetoric which actively makes others less safe. I don't know how, and I don't know what rhetoric they're talking about. The students assert, Rarely do these mainstream conversations of free speech consider the urgent need for people of color and other marginalized people to speak back against systems of of oppression for their own self-preservation. The students even cite the Brown University Student Code of Conduct despite acknowledging that if, quote, that it is a, quote, a document which we continue to question, saying that according to Section 9 of the Code of Student Conduct, or Section 11, actually, Brown University students cannot support behavior that is intended to or can reasonably be expected to result in significant emotional or psychological harm. The speech, however, went quite well, according to a tweet by Benson, who praised the, quote, great crowd, fun experience, and solid questions, especially from students who don't share my views. So, yeah, there's a a little letter from the people that are supposedly the intellectual, uh, you know, the intellectual vanguard of this next generation. I mean, these are the kind of people that 
are supposed to be shaping the inten intelligentsia of the nation going forward, these people in college, and, uh, you know, free speech supporting that is explicitly dangerous somehow, without explicitly saying how. Because uh, marginalized people apparently can't handle it. Let's go now to the last story for current year college craziness, which I, I, I saved for last because it, you know, hits close to home for me. And it's in regards to uh, the school that I've gone to, which uh, I'm currently not in school, uh, Texas State University. A libertarian socialist organization recently spent several hours recruiting at Texas State University while prominently displayed an Antifa flag. Uh, when s students objected, pointing out that Antifa groups often engage in political violence, the, quote, Athenian youth retorted that Antifa is not terrorist, though the group said it has issues with Marxists and Maoists. So yeah, uh, I put this here because um, it's stuff that I actually have knowledge to. I wasn't out on the campus when this Antifa you know, group was out there recruiting openly with the Antifa flag. But, um, you know, I've heard of the Athenian youth before, and they call themselves a libertarian socialist organization, which, uh, you know, I, I talked about libertarian socialism in the political, idea, or political theories podcast, which we did, which I'm not going to be one of these people on the right that says, oh, libertarian socialism, that's a huge contradiction. Actually, libertarian socialism predates uh, American libertarianism. Uh, you, you could also say it's uh, red and black anarchism, uh, anarcho-syndicalism. It's stuff of that sort. Uh, I mean, generally these people are pretty vehement to work with communists, and oftentimes you can't decipher their rhetoric from that from communists, but uh, I guess technically they're not communists. But, um, yeah, these, uh, these libertarian socialists that were recruiting for Antifa also the day before spit on a member of the college republicans at texas state so um yeah you know uh it's crazy that this stuff is happening on a campus that you know i used to have political tables on i used to be someone in charge of a uh, tabling for the college libertarian group there and now we have antifa groups table in there in the in the same space that i used to it just shows you how radical things have changed in this country to where you see things such as that i forget where it was but there was recently an article that ranked freedom of speech on campuses and you know they ranked like the 10 worst and uh texas state made the list you know, you know let me go into some of the stuff about this athenian youth though uh, according to the group's founding document called Athenian Youth Manifesto, the group believes in libertarian socialism, listing their principles of direct democracy, cooperative economics, and community self-defense. Quote, We believe in creating a world beyond wage labor, the manifesto states, and proclaims that modern polic policing is, quote, is an inherently oppressive institution existing exclusive for the benefit of the ruling capital class. So you know when the when the police are called to stop the uh, you know stop the mass shooter on your high school campus, that's only for the benefit of the ruling capitalist class, apparently. Additionally, the manifesto lists the reduction of quote bullshit jobs, quote the democratization of finance investment allocation of big resources and political life in general and quote the elimination of nation state borders and the equalization of economic abundance as eventual goals it's so crazy how stupid very very stupid deluded some of the people are in a, a place I've called home for many years. San Marcos, Texas. But yeah, you know, there's just uh, Antifa groups now. Ad just advocating on college campuses. And, uh, you know, Texas State won't be the last one. But uh, yeah, that's current year college craziness for the week. 
Uh, I'm going to take a short little break. I'm going to get some water, and I'll come back, and we'll finish out some international news. So uh, hang in there for a second. Hey, Patriots and Warriors, this is Bass Stickman, and you are listening to Trump Republic Radio. We were minding our own business, trying to celebrate the free speech that you think is so important, and you came to our rally and you chanted, You're fags. Go home. You have low testosterone. And he's been on many very prominent right-wing shows talking about uh, his cause, and that would be Simon Roach of the Savelanders. Hello, hello, Enzo. Hello, Robert. Thank you very much for having me. Now, let me say this. It has been my privilege. You you won't see it from my perspective, so I'm not going to, you know, it's pointless me trying to persuade you, uh, but uh, you will, uh, let me just tell you I'm very grateful, very grateful for this opportunity. I appreciate it very much. And if you'd like me to come on again at any time, hopefully there will be fewer difficulties and challenges. And I won't mess you around as I have done this time, for which I'm very sorry. Uh, but I would love to come on again. Anytime you ask, I'll be there. Please call China and tell them we are all counting on China. Tell the president we became friends for two days. That he was great. You really have to walk me through this here because I am not familiar with so much of the terminology. Like, for instance, can you shed some light on what is a cuck? <laughs> a cuck. How much money will you make today banging that drum for Soros? Soros must pay you good money to bang that drum. Whoa. Hey, do you play ping pong? Welcome back from the break. Uh, thank you for staying here with us. It's still just me, Enzo Quesada, the only host on this podcast. And uh, we're going to go into some international news. We're going to start out with the Middle East. And the first thing I want to talk about is some fighting that's been going on in Syria. So on February 7th, outside of the city of Deir Azur, uh, the United States bombed some troops that were coming near a base out there that we didn't even know existed. And uh, it's come out now that, you know, the individuals that we killed, which is around 200 of them, were a group of Russian military contractors. So Russian mercenaries fighting on the behalf of... Russia and, you know, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad were killed by American airstrikes. This is not something that, you know, I've seen talked about in the media at all whatsoever. But, um, yeah, this is the first time that we've blown up Russian troops. And, you know, Putin's not made a big deal about this at all. But, um, if he wanted to, he definitely could. You know, our involvement in Syria is getting so dangerous now, and we don't have a right to be there as a nation, you know. Our presence as America in Syria is violating international law. We're violating the sovereignty of Syria. We're not invited guests there like Russia or Hezbollah is. You know, whatever you think of those organizations, they actually have a right to be there. And, you know, our involvement in Syria, you know, on the heels of this airstriking of these Russian mercenaries, it's uh, it's getting us into some dangerous folds. But I just want to, you know, give a little update. Uh, initially, the numbers weren't known when it happened, but uh, it's now known. It's at least 200 were killed. Uh, the other thing I want to get into as far as the Middle East is in regards to Israel. Uh... Prime Minister of Israel Benjamin Netanyahu is facing a potential indictment after a police investigation reportedly urged the official be charged formally for alleged misconduct that includes accepting bribes and corruption. 
So, um, if you didn't know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who has been in power there um, in Israel for quite a while now, he's had a lot of different, you know, corruptions, charges thrown at him throughout the years, uh, charges of bribery. It's gotten to the point now to where the police are recommending indictment of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, you know, has said he will continue to stay in power as long as he can, you know, that he, he cited himself that half of, less than 50% of indictments reckoned by, recommended by the police ever materialize. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be some conflict in the inner workings of Israel there. You know, personally, I'm not a fan of Netanyahu whatsoever. I know there's a lot of people in the American right that are... But, uh, I don't know, I'm not a fan of the stuff that Israel does in general out there. Uh, they get us way too involved with, uh, their neighbors. Just like they have been, you know, shooting way too many airstrikes into Syria recently. You know, stoking more tensions out there. Not good stuff. Let's go on now to a study out of Germany I want to, uh, touch on as our European news for the week. And that is uh, a study on the effects of digitalization. A study by the IT association Bitkom, seen by the Frankfurter Allemann Zeitung on Friday, projects that 3.4 million jobs in Germany will become redundant in the next five years as robots and algorithms take over the work of humans. Given the fact that there are currently around 33 million people in employ regular employment in Germany, that figure amounts to roughly every 10th job in the country. So yeah, you know, many times before we've talked about the coming automization in you know the United States, but you know the prospects around the world, and you know at least in the industrialized world, are. Also, coming very quickly to a point where a lot of jobs are going to become irrelevant. As I said, a tenth of all jobs in Germany within the next five years. And you look at, you know, the whole, the, the migrant crisis. Germany has taken, in, you know, I believe the most, if not the most, migrants in the, in the face of all these crises. And we talked before on the show... You look at studies, over 95% of, you know, these millions of migrants that they've brought in don't work whatsoever. And they're brought in under the pretense of, oh, the German population is aging. We need foreign workers to pay the pensions of the people that are, you know, going into retirement. But these people don't work so whatsoever. And with the coming digitalization and automization in Germany... The jobs that these people could potentially even work aren't even going to be there anymore. You know, you're going to have a situation where German natives aren't even going to have jobs. And, you know, that's a prediction only for five years. What's going to be the, the rate of automation in 10 years, in 20 years? It's, uh, it's a little crazy. And, you know, I got a, rec a report out of Die Welt, a uh, newspaper in Germany, just to accompany this. Unaccompanied minors, uh, you know, unaccompanied minors, the third world migrants that have shown up on the doors of Germany, are costing the country's taxpayers at least $3.5 billion every single year. So if the jobs are gone, who... You know, where is the tax money going to come to pay for these, you know, unaccompanied minors? On top of all the, you know, migrants that you've let in that you can't, don't work whatsoever as it is. Because they get plenty of welfare out there. You know, Germany has a very robust welfare system. Really makes you think, you know, the situation isn't so good. Let's go on to African news now. Uh, I want to start it off with a little thing from an expert on Africa who says that uh, Western aid may have contributed to the next migrant crisis. 
African specialist Stephen Smith has warned that the next migrant crisis is on the horizon as Africa's population continues to boom and that Western aid, particularly education, may contribute to Africans seeking a better life in Europe. Mr. Smith, the author of the new book, The Rush to Europe, warned that the exploding demographics of Africa will have direct consequences for Europe. According to Smith, in the coming decades, young Africans will likely migrate to Europe as the slowly developing economies of their home nations cannot provide them jobs. Quote, it's this pyramid of age that makes 40% of the population less than 15 years old, Smith said, and added, the migratory pressure can only increase. Uh, Smith also noted that the common misconception that those who come to Europe are from poor economic backgrounds, saying middle-class migrants, quote, are the ones who come out of the water, who have a view of the world, who know where to go, who are on Facebook with a mobile phone, and the 2,000 to 3,000 euros needed to embark on the journey. Western development aid might also contribute to the next migrant crisis, according to Smith. Quote, it's terrible paradox, he said, adding, development aid, we've been trying it for almost 60 years. Are there any success? So yeah, you know, the West thinking that, oh, it can help, uh, Africa by giving it all this aid is actually enabling Africans to migrate to Europe. You know, as he said, it's the it's mainly the middle class actually that can afford to go to Africa that has the means to Africa. It's not the poorest of the poor. I mean, not go to Africa to go to Europe. It's not the poorest of the poor that goes. And uh, you know, they talk about. African, you know, demographics, let me quickly look this up. I know, you know, there are currently Africa, you know, there's not even a million people there, or a billion people there, but by the end of this century, they're predicted something like to have four billion people in Africa, you know, over half of the world's population will be Africa in the next coming century. It's, uh, it's not something that it's going to be assailed easily. You can't have all these people flooding into Europe. You know, as we just said with uh, the little study out of Germany, there's not going to be jobs for these people, but they're still going to come. It's uh, it's not going to end well. Uh, I wish I could find the exact uh, numbers on this Africa demographic boom. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to stay focused on the next stuff. I'll try to do it while I'm talking about the next thing. Because it is an important thing to go into. But, uh, going on to my other story that I have out of Africa. It's um in regards to South Africa, which is a place near and dear to my heart since... Uh, We've done so many interviews with people from Africa, or South Africa, and the destitute situation of the Boers out there. Uh, looks like things in South Africa are about to get a little more unstable. In a speech on Wednesday, South African President Jacob Zuma announced his resignation effective immediately after losing the support of his party, the African National Congress, or the ANC. He has been president since May 2009, but has, sent, has been significantly pressured to resign under allegations of corruption. Now, Zuma, uh, he's been under tons of allegations of corruption uh, throughout his entire breath as uh, president of South Africa. He's the second president of South Africa. And, you know, to, you know, people have told me not too bright an individual either, but, you know, and we've gone extensively, extensively on the show in the South Africa stuff. You can look at our interviews with Simon Roach or Karen Smith or the interview I did with, what is the other lady that I talked to? You know, you can look up all the different interviews I've done with South Africans. I've done quite a few at this point on the show. Uh, 
you know, their economy has already been downgraded to beyond junk status. You know, you got the economic freedom fighters promising to violently take white-owned land in South Africa from the white minority. And now you have a situation where the South African president is resigning. So political instability in South Africa is only looking to get worse. Now... I want to touch on those South Af- or the African demographic boom that uh, that expert mentioned. I-, I finally have the information in front of me. This is information from 2015 from Africa's demographic transition uh, di- dividend or disaster report done by the uh, World Bank. The population in Africa is exp- rapidly expanding, and by 2060. The region will hold an estimated 2.8 billion people. 2.8 billion people. How how are we supposed to feed all these people? I have no idea. Especially with the state of how poor African nations are as well. But believe me, millions upon millions upon millions of people... In this, you know, coming boom of Africa, because currently, you know, they have less than, less than a billion people. Let me look up the exact population for you. The population of Africa, as it currently stands, okay, I stand corrected. It currently has 1.2 billion people, as of 2016. But going from 1.2 in 2016. To two point eight in twenty sixty, it's an extremely rapid boom. And uh, you know, I've seen predictions, as I said before, it's supposed to break you know four billion by the end of the century. So we'll, we'll have to somehow contend with that in the future. It'll be hard. Uh, let me go now to the last story that we have, which is a study out of Australia that I wanted to go into. There's a, a story kind of on global warming and uh, yeah, how some of the beliefs on global warming have actually been debunked. A new study produced by researchers at the University of Auckland concludes that forecasts about the impact of climate change on some low-lying islands have failed to take into account key factors and thus have overstated the danger posed to inhabitants. The most counterintuitive finding in the study, the Pacific Island nation of Tuvalu, the poster child of sinking island fears, is not, is not only sinking, it is actually growing in size. The study highlighted by uh, phys.org examined changes in the geography of Tuvalu's nine atolls and 101 reef islands between 1971 and 2014 with aerial photography and satellite imagery. Over that period, eight of the atolls and almost three quarters of the islands grew. In total, rather than shrinking in landmass, Tuvalu's total land area increased by 2.9%. This increase is part, particularly counterintuitive because the area in which Tuvalu is located is supposedly it is supposed to have suffered a rise in sea levels that are, quote, twice the global average. Uh, here's a little quote from the thing. Uh, We tend to think of Pacific atolls as static landforms that will simply be inundated as sea levels rise. But there is growing evidence these islands are geographically dynamic and constantly changing, said co-author Paul Kennedy, head of the School of Environment at the University of Auckland. The the study's findings may seem counterintuitive. Uh, given that the sea level has been ri- rising in the region over the past century, but the dominant mode of change over that time uh, on Tuvalu has been expansion, not erosion. So I just want to leave you with that little study. Uh, you can look it up personally yourself if you want to, just to give you a little ammo, because you know, the leftists want to talk about oh, you got to watch out for climate change. We're all going to be underwater. One of their biggest 
you know, examples that they point to in Tuvalu is actually grown while sea levels has rised. So, yeah. So, yeah, um, that's going to be the show for this week. Uh, we're going to have Bobby back on for next Sunday. Hopefully I did a good enough job being the only host this week. Uh, again, if it seemed a little unorganized at times, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I haven't done this uh, before by myself. i uh, been a bit nervous, but I'm surprised that, you know, I made it this far. And uh, I don't know, maybe in the future I'll do more shows by myself. But uh, with that said, I just want to thank you for listening to another episode of Trump Public Radio, and have a good one.